I'm Sarah Kensier, the author of the best-selling books, The View from Flyover Country and Hiding in Plain Sight. I'm Andrea Chalupa, a journalist and filmmaker and the writer and producer of the journalistic thriller, Mr. Jones, about Stalin's genocide famine in Ukraine. And this is Gaslit Nation, a podcast covering corruption in the United States and rising autocracy around the world. And that autocracy is on display this week with Joe Biden on his world tour and his summit with Putin, uh, which we believe we will be covering in a special episode later this week. So Joe Biden has proclaimed to our allies that, quote, America is back. But what does America is back even mean? Back from being an overt mafia state run by a sociopathic career criminal Kremlin asset? Sure. Removed from the conditions that allowed a sociopathic career criminal Kremlin asset to become president in the first place? Not so much. In case you haven't been paying attention to Trump crime cult accomplice Merrick Garland, the mafia state is still in place and thriving, and we'll get more into that later. But first, some basic questions about America's position on the world stage. If I were one of our allies, I would not trust the US for shit. Would I be relieved that Trump was out? Of course. But would I believe that the US took the threat of Trump seriously, or that it takes the threat of autocracy seriously and the threat of transnational organized crime seriously? No, not based on the Biden administration's actions so far. The refusal to enforce accountability for Trump administration crimes is not just a domestic crisis, but a foreign relations crisis. It is a crisis of trust. Think about this from the perspective of a foreign country looking to work with the United States. What message does it send when a government won't investigate an attack on its own capital by seditionists who are now again announcing their plans for a sequel unimpeded? What message does it send when the former president was a known mafia associate who pardoned the criminals who aided him and those criminals who are deeply immersed in international affairs as well as U.S. affairs are now roaming free? Who would trust that country? Jake Sullivan, one of Biden's key foreign policy advisors, was asked how Biden would heal the scars of the Trump era. And he had this to say, and I'm quoting him now. I think our view going into this trip is that actions speak louder than words and that showing that the United States is capable of turning the corner in the pandemic, showing that the United States is capable of making the dramatic investments that will pull us up and out of this economic recovery and help power global growth, showing the world that we are ultimately capable of making the investments in R&D and infrastructure, innovation and workforce, Ultimately, setting that foundation for this country will be the most effective way to show the rest of the world that the U.S. has the power and purpose to be able to deliver as the world's leading democracy. So that's what he's going to try to demonstrate. And he, as I said at the outset, feels he goes into this from a position of strength because of the record he's built up over the course of the first four months. So that's the end of that quote. However, refusing to enforce accountability is not strength. It is dangerous denial that hurts not only Americans, but anyone who deals with the US. Yes, it's true that actions speak louder than words. And when it comes to elite criminal impunity and compromised institutions, there has been little action. Do not forget that from 2017 to 2021, Trump and his lackeys treated NATO like a protection racket. They threatened some foreign officials with violence and blackmailed others. They backed the enemies of our allies and the allies of our enemies. They threatened our own democratic stability in the United States in the most blatant of ways, and nearly everyone involved in these crimes has walked free, with the Biden administration showing not even an intent to stop them. Again, why should any foreign official trust a successor administration that won't enforce accountability? As we've said many times, the Trump administration was a transnational crime syndicate masquerading as a government. A bunch of its lackeys are still in office, as we see most obviously in the DOJ. Others are roaming free with state secrets that can be used to hurt U.S. allies. If I were a foreign leader, I'd ask Biden about that ongoing national security threat. Andrea, what are your thoughts? 
Well, I think what we're witnessing here with a summit with the most powerful person in the world, the President of the United States, and a mass murdering xenophobic dictator who is the head of a sweeping criminal mafia state that is destabilizing not just its region, but the broader world. I think when you have a situation like that, you have to ask yourself who actually won the Cold War. I think this is a time for us to reflect as Americans, as people who want to live in stable democracies, as historians. The KGB turned into the FSB, and they worked in tangent over many years in weaponizing greed and corruption in the West. And now Putin is arguably the richest man in the world, especially when you factor in not just his stolen wealth, but the court of Russian oligarchs that he closely controls and keeps an eye on. So this whole thing reeks of a bit of a hostage situation, as though Biden, even if he didn't want to, had to meet with Putin. And obviously, he put some boundaries on that, like not holding the press conference. We had this bleeding under Putin in the U.S. of the cyber warfare. It was sweeping. It wasn't just, of course, colonial pipeline. It was going back farther than that. There was Kremlin and Russian hacking of hospitals as the U.S. was struggling with the worst of the pandemic. There's just utter criminal shamelessness of what Putin has been doing to the U.S., just emboldened by the weakness of our position in encountering Putin. And this is weakness that we're showing for many years under Obama, just a, an utter lack of imagination and understanding of how the Kremlin works. Think of the most ruthless individual possible. Think of someone that would take candy from a baby. So think of that ruthless person who will grab your Super Bowl ring from you and never give it back. That's Putin. And he keeps outplaying the West to the point where now he has a summit on the world stage. And what that signals to Biden's European allies that he needs to convince to come on his side on many issues in terms of countering not just Kremlin aggression, but Chinese aggression, what that signals to the Western allies is Putin is saying loud and clear, look at me. You all have to play ball with me. France has to work with me. Germany has to work with me. Boris Johnson has to work with me. You all have to work with me because I can get a summit with the President of the United States. That hurts Biden's leverage when he needs to negotiate with his Western allies on anything else because it shows a tendency to fold. And let me tell you something else. The weird line that Jen Psaki and Biden and Biden's team keeps repeating when it comes to Putin is that they are determined to have a predictable relationship with Putin. They are determined to have a predictable relationship with Putin. They keep using that word predictable, not understanding that Putin's weapon is chaos. He thrives on chaos. He leverages chaos. Under Putin, Russian forces deliberately slaughtered civilians in Syria. They deliberately targeted hospitals along with Assad's forces. They did this in part not just to weaken the opposition and to prop up their puppet Assad so that Russia would have a proxy state on the Mediterranean, which it could then use to further pressure the West and its geopolitical interests. They also did this to flood Europe with refugees. And at the same time, they were financially propping up all these xenophobic, far-right political Kremlin clown cars across Europe that were running for office trying to break up the EU, the EU being a regulatory body that in principle tries to stand for accountability and human rights in principle. When you see this summit with Biden and Putin on Wednesday, if you want an indication of how well Putin is playing this hand, this hand that has been in development since the collapse of the Soviet Union, when the KGB just changed its initials to the FSB and their dark arts continued and ramped up as they took advantage of globalization by outsourcing their corruption, exporting their corruption, and buying off officials, buying off the journalists, expanding their propaganda networks, expanding their shell companies, expanding their dark money across the West. If you want to see how well Putin is now harvesting those three decades of work, look at how long 
Putin makes Biden wait for that meeting. Because Putin is infamous of making world leaders wait for him. He does it to Angela Merkel. He does it to everybody. So the big question on Wednesday is how long is Putin going to make Biden wait? And how is Biden going to handle that? If Biden's team is as wishful thinking or as paid off or a combination of that, those factors, if they're that far gone, you have to watch for signs of how naive or how paid off are they when it comes to dealing with the Kremlin. You can see signs of that based on how they deal with that power move of how Putin's going to make Biden wait for him. So I'm going to be looking out for that. The whole thing is a sham. Alexei Navalny is rotting in prison. Alexei Navalny gave, I had the courage to go back to Russia to show Russians, don't be afraid. His message directly to the Russian people was, do not be afraid. Now they're trying to kill him slowly in prison, like so many other political prisoners have died under Putin. There's been a ramp up of Soviet-style repression against the opposition. Alexei Navalny's party and supporters are now banned from running for office. You're left with just controlled opposition in Russia. The terror is heightened right now. This is not a man that is deserving of sharing the global stage with the President of the United States. This is not a man deserving of holding court on MSNBC in an interview with Keir Simmons. Keir Simmons is the same Barbie doll on-air reporter who got trolled publicly by Putin. In 2019, Keir Simmons was on a stage with Putin and asked him, you know, Robert Mueller said, you're attacking the 2020 election, are you? What a dumb question, first of all. And Putin, of course, took that layup and sunk a basket and said, let me tell you a secret, you little mosquito, lean in close. You know, like Putin <laughs> trolled him and said, Yes, I am, but don't tell anyone. Shh. And the whole audience laughed at Keir Simmons. Putin must have masturbated to that video for many nights to come. So who got the big interview with Putin this week? Keir Simmons, that same gimp on a leash. Putin trotted him <laughs> out for his MSNBC interview. So let me just tell you something. What Keir Simmons and MSNBC did was morally criminal by giving Putin that platform. Putin has arguably one of the largest television machines in the world. All of Russian state TV is Putin TV. He's strangled all of the independents out of television in Russia. There used to be an SNL, Saturday Night Lifestyle show that used to make fun of Putin. That's now gone. That was in the early days. He made sure to get rid of that. And now it's all Putin TV all the time. And he's brainwashing Russians into Putinism and into seeing enemies within and enemies without. And that's how he maintains his control. And not only that, he does these hour-long press conferences where he's thrown all these softball questions where he can never bring him himself to say the name of Alexei Navalny as though it's like a curse. And if he says it, his Botox will suddenly be undone. <laughs> and Putin has a global platform. He doesn't need MSNBC in addition to that. And all MSNBC did was bend over and allow Putin to flank his power as a mass murdering autocrat. So well done, MSNBC. Well done, naive and or corrupt Biden officials who gave your boss the stupidest advice of humiliating the United States by sharing a stage with mass murderer Putin. This is an embarrassing moment for the U.S. It's an embarrassing moment for the Western alliance. And everyone who contributed to both MSNBC interview and the Biden-Putin summit should be ashamed. And you should be forced to look at the photos of the Syrians who were bombed, of the Ukrainians who were bombed, of the Venezuelans who are starving right now by their dictator that's propped up by Putin and so forth. All of those victims, the countless victims, the lives that Putin has destroyed, that's blood that's also in your hands now for legitimizing a mass murdering dictator. Well done. Yeah. You know, as to the motivation here, I mean, part of me, like, I don't care whether it's naivete or malice in some instances because the end result is the same. And the end result is deeply dangerous for the United States and for all of the countries you just mentioned and for anybody in the Kremlin line of fire. And as we've noted on the show many times, you know, the Kremlin is intertwined with transnational organized crime from around the world, with white supremacist movements from around the world, with corrupt plutocrats and oligarchs from around the world. So this is truly an international crisis. And and the Biden administration has a tough challenge and instead is preemptively folding in certain respects. You know, as we've obviously know, it's it's a vast improvement than having an actual Kremlin asset supplicating himself publicly on a stage to Putin. And there have been some improvements in the directions that they went where, you know, Biden is not doing a joint press conference. But, you know, the summit should not be 
happening at all. And I don't have great confidence just for all the reasons you listed in the manner that's being carried out. And there was a thread yesterday that I thought was pretty interesting in terms of how things were worded from Mikhail Holdorkovsky, who is a basically an oligarch in exile, extremely wealthy Russian businessman who got in a variety of entanglements with Putin, with the Kremlin over multiple decades, and now I think is living in Switzerland. So anyway, he did a English language thread. It's worth reading the whole thing. We'll link to it in the show notes. The first two tweets from it, I thought were interesting because of the phrasing used, where he says, it is clear that the upcoming Biden-Putin summit in Geneva is a meeting between the leader of the free world and a murderous gangster with a nuclear button. Western politicians will always claim, quote, we don't negotiate with terrorists, but the reality is, of course, more nuanced, and in many cases, the devil is in the details. If a terrorist held millions hostage with a nuclear weapon, I'd be the last person to impede negotiations in this unfortunately similar scenario. I thought that was interesting. I don't think he's saying that Putin or the Kremlin are actually threatening nuclear war. I think this is a metaphorical statement, but I think that he may be implying that the extent of the cyber attacks that have been taking place steadily over a decade and that obviously accelerated under Trump because Trump left the door open for those attacks to occur may be effectively holding the West hostage. And I was wondering what you thought about that. I think without question, the Russian criminality under Putin is certainly holding the West hostage. I think it's not just the cyber warfare, because the big advantage that Russia has under Putin that the West doesn't seem to grasp or know how to counter at all is that Putin is willing to go there. It's the brazenness. It's you know sending his spies to go kill people on British soil than running propaganda pieces that are so ridiculous and covering up their crimes, saying, yeah, our spies were just at this cathedral just for tourism. Those dead bodies had nothing to do with us and, and our chemical agents. And note the tourist <laughs> excuse is the exact same tourist excuse that they're now dragging out for the capital right. attacks. These blatant acts of terrorism, they're like, oh, we're just tourists. And it's just, it's funny to them. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, there's a lot of parallels clearly with the Kremlin and Republican authoritarianism because the active measures are the same. The psyops are the same. And as a great symbol of that, you had Putin's favorite congressman, Dana Rohrabacher, who was in Congress for many years. And he was sort of that lone weirdo in Congress that would always parrot Kremlin talking points. And we couldn't wait to get rid of him. And then we voted him out in the blue wave in 2018, and suddenly Dana Warbacher multiplies across Congress. And now you have Ron Johnson of Wisconsin, and you've got Devin Nunes of California, and so forth. And it's like the game of whack-a-mole we keep talking about, the Kremlin whack-a-mole in the U.S. Congress. Dana Warbacher, it turns out, was there. Putin's favorite congressman was there at the Capitol siege, <laughs> along with everyone else. You had one of these white supremacist terrorists who laid siege to the Capitol appearing proudly on Russian propaganda TV, you know, sharing his story. So there's definitely a marriage there, certainly in values, certainly in tactics. In terms of the leverage the Kremlin has over us, they are ruthless. They are ruthless in, in a way that the West simply does not understand. And this dates back to the times of Stalin. Putin has resurrected Stalin as a great hero, beloved by Russians, never mind all the countless that he killed. And he's done this to show victory and might and also justifying ruthless tactics. I mean, you had the Soviet Union, you know, our ally in World War II, they killed off the Polish intelligentsia and the Katyn massacre, they waited on the sidelines, letting the Nazis destroy the Polish resistance in the Warsaw Uprising. They did all this in order to make Poland easier to occupy, which they occupied for several generations, leading to all this state terror against Poles under Soviet occupation and so forth. That's just one example of how ruthless they were. And so Putin is carrying on that tradition, and the West is just so unprepared and hasn't come up with any good solution to it and continues to force a normal relationship and continues to reward them with 
blood money contracts. Like look at Nord Stream 2, which Anthony Blinken, as Secretary of State, promised that he was going to stop during his confirmation hearing. And instead, the U.S. is allowing that to move forward. And what Nord Stream 2 is, we've talked about a lot on this show because it's horrifying. So if you watch my film, Mr. Jones, there's this scene based on a true story, a true scene. It was covered in New Yorker magazine at the time. In my film, Mr. Jones, showing this scene covered in New Yorker magazine at the time, you see all these Russian officials and titans of American industry cheersing, toasting each other in the Waldorf Astoria. This actually happened. And they're doing this in the fall of 1933, when Stalin has just gotten away with mass murdering millions of people deliberately in a genocide famine, the vast majority from Ukraine. And he did this to colonize Ukraine. He did this to steal Ukraine's agriculture and sell it abroad in order to raise the money to rapidly modernize his empire. And what happened? No accountability. Instead, he gets rewarded with, as symbolized in this big fancy banquet, the Walter Pastoria between titans of U.S. industry and Russian officials to show let's make money. Genocides, mass murder, human rights, all those issues are so inconvenient to the almighty prophet. And so what we have here is history repeating. So you have Blinken looking the other way, Biden looking the other way, allowing Nord Stream 2 to move forward. And it's that scene from my film, Mr. Jones. It's the exact same scene where you have all of these European corporations. It's not just Germany. It's France. It's other EU countries that are working with the Russian state to build a pipeline between Russia and Germany, which is going to bypass Ukraine which is going to deprive Ukraine of much needed revenue right now. Because normally Russia's gas pipeline passes through Ukraine and Ukraine gets to make money off of that. Russia's like, nope, we're going to cut you out of this deal. And not only that, we're going to economically destroy you by invading your country. So this pipeline is economic warfare against Ukraine, already added to the economic warfare against Ukraine of Putin's ongoing invasion. And so what this pipeline is doing is on top of that, it is further entrenching Germany's dependence on Russian gas. What is that all doing? That's basically putting Germany in a corner where it can't stand up to Russian aggression because it's dependent on Russian gas. Do you see how fucked up the situation is? And also, do you know who's in charge of this project? Do tell. Well, you have Putin's old friend from East Germany, where Putin was a KGB agent. You have a former Stasi agent from East Germany who worked with Putin there, who's running this project because it is a deliberate economic warfare project to divide the West and to contain the West and to avoid all accountability and to further weaken Ukraine so it could further increase its chances of colonizing Ukraine. Because as the saying goes, Russia with Ukraine is a superpower. Russia wants all the rich resources and the geopolitical position of Ukraine. That's the end goal here. Do you understand? So if Ukraine falls, you're going to have a massive nation the size of France right on the EU's borders under a Russian occupation. And Russia is working towards that goal, chipping away at it, chipping away at it year after year. And Biden and Blinken just allowed it to get closer. And so did Germany and the rest of the EU by allowing Nord Stream 2 to move forward. This is a very dangerous time And I don't see anybody in the West showing any leadership, any spine, any strategy for containing the Kremlin's aggression. They all act as though they're waking up every morning with amnesia and trying to make friends with the biggest bully on the block. And I don't even think we have any sort of structure in place to withstand Kremlin aggression either, because you have the Kremlin asset of the Republican Party slowing down the infrastructure bill which would go a very long way in in protecting us from Russia's cyber warfare. So all of the situation combined is, I just don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what they're doing. I mean, there's been some cheering about Biden doing basic things, you know, treating our allies in the EU, in Europe, as our allies instead of our enemy, not doing the things that Trump did, which involved threatening Canada and Australia and, you know, the EU countries. Of course, Biden did do some things that were pointedly, you know, meant to show that the U.S. was going to protect former republics of the Soviet Union that are now independent states like Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, when he met with heads of state from those nations before his NATO meeting yesterday. I do think that was pointed. I obviously think that that was a good idea since the Trump administration completely screwed over those countries, lied to them multiple times, consistently threatened to abandon NATO, abandon them to Kremlin aggression, Kremlin conquest yet again. But there are these 
major elephants in the room, so to speak, the elephant of the Republican Party working on behalf of a hostile foreign state on behalf of Russia. And not just the examples you listed of you know former people like Rohrbach or current people like Ron Johnson, Devin Nunes, but like the entire apparatus is structured in this way. We had a Kremlin asset at the helm of our country, and you might think that he's a fucking moron, and you know maybe there's some, <laughs> some point to that, but he's surrounded by savvy operators, and he's a career criminal, and he's good at being a career criminal, and he's actually pretty good at keeping secrets when those secrets are incredibly destructive to his own financial assets, when he feels that his impunity is actually threatened. You know, He managed to keep Epstein a secret. He kept a lot of financial trans- transactions a secret, and has threatened people into secrecy, threatened people into silence. And we'll get into that later. But I really wonder, like, beyond just the seeming inability of this administration to understand the terms of leverage when you deal with the Kremlin, that when you're saying we want a stable relationship and the other party is constantly privileging chaos over that, that you're going to be automatically on the losing end there. There are things like the cyber attack situation, the attacks on our critical infrastructure that have had me worried since 2014 when Russia attacked the DOD, the State Department, the White House, the DNC, the RNC, private companies. Then, of course, it's accelerated throughout the Trump administration. It accelerated greatly in 2020 in the worst cyber attack on the United States by a foreign country in U.S. history. That is still ongoing. We still don't fully know the damage. And so then you see stuff come out like this article or many articles about this where I'm quoting one from UPI, Vladimir Putin offers Joe Biden exchange of cyber criminals ahead of summit. So this is yet another strange situation where Putin says, quote, if we agree on extradition of criminals, then Russia will naturally do that, but only if the other side, in this case, the United States, agrees to the same and will also extradite corresponding criminals to the Russian Federation. And if you've listened to our interview with Bill Browder, which we taped a few weeks ago, Putin has a very loose and expansive definition of what constitutes a criminal, which is basically anyone who may oppose him, anyone who may be a threat to his power. It's the same way of viewing the world as Trump, because this is a fellow mafia state actor. And so, you know, the Biden administration initially kind of blew this off, or Saki said, quote, be a topic of direct discussion with President Putin and President Biden. And at that point, I had flashbacks to when like Trump said that he and Putin were going to have a joint cybersecurity partnership. This is back in 2017, and that Rudy Giuliani was going to be the top cyber official. And oh, God. But then, uh, you know, they, they did backtrack. The advisor I mentioned before, Jake Sullivan, clarified and said Biden is not saying he's going to be exchanging cyber criminals with Russia. There's no cyber criminals who have committed crimes in Russia that he's looking at and thinking, I'm going to exchange them. I mean, it's just all of this. I mean, I I don't know. (laughs) I'm like biting my tongue because on one hand, it's like I desperately want the Biden administration to succeed here. Like, we're not happy to be criticizing them on this. We're not happy about the lack of accountability. We're not happy that they don't really seem to have learned important lessons of the last four years, lessons that have to do with the very survival of the United States as a sovereign nation. And it's hard to tell at times how much they are keeping close to the chest when you're dealing with a regime like the Kremlin. You know, I think we'll see more on Wednesday, tomorrow in terms of how they behave and how much they are just being bullheaded about it, being extremely stubborn and refusing to actually realize, you know, we are not in a position of strength. Like no country could be in a position of strength when its institutions are hijacked from within, purged, gutted, its courts are packed, basic rights, like the right to vote, are deeply threatened. The Democrats are on the verge of losing the very small amount of power that they've managed to accumulate, you know, losing the House in 2022, not having free and fair elections. Like this is just blatantly not a position of strength. And I think it's better to just admit that to just admit, well, you know, here are our flaws. Because the thing is, it's like 
Everyone can see them. We can see them here in the United States and foreign actors can see them from abroad and they can see that the Biden administration is not fixing them. And this is the exact same problem that happened during the Obama administration where all of our faults, all of our flaws were out in plain sight in part to a much greater degree because of social media. And the remedy to that is you fix the fucking flaws. You do something, you pass new policies, policies, you pass new laws, you call out bad actors, you try to do what's right, you try to do what's just, and then you are protected, not just morally, not just legally, but you're protected pragmatically to a greater degree from foreign threats than if you just look the other way or cover your eyes or pretend it's not happening. We can see it's happening, they can see it's happening, and they know how to exploit those flaws to a massive, massive degree. So I just don't think that they can truly pull this off. It's like, yes, we're all really that Biden is there instead of Trump, but it's not enough. They need to gut out the rot and they need to be far more blatant, both in their messaging to the American public, who is demanding accountability, and to foreign actors abroad, that they're not going to stand for this level of corruption. Speaking of rot, so it's been reported that advising Biden for a summit with Putin, you have Michael McFall, who was the engineer of the original Russian reset. And Fiona Hill, who called another Russian reset last year, and days later, Putin poisoned Navalny. So you have these institutionalists who are determined to make fetch happen. I don't know. Like they're determined <laughs> to work with Putin make no matter what. Reset happen. Exactly. <laughs> it's like Michael McFall wakes up every morning as though he's born for the first time and looks out at the world with baby eyes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he has like amnesia. Exactly. Like his Twitter account, half the time I'm just like, is this like a test? Is this some sort of Buddhist koan and we're supposed to yeah. just kind of try to delineate some kind of meaning? Because it's like, dude, this is Russia 101 and you're supposed to be like the diplomat master here and you've got like 500 randos in your mentions correcting you on basic things. But go on, go on. Every tweet from Michael McFall reads in my head as, golly, gee, gosh. <laughs> that's, all, yep. that's all Michael McFall says. That's like his his internal monologue. Fiona Hill, I don't know her excuse. I think she's just become such an institutionalist and she's trying to be, quote unquote, bipartisan with Putin and the West and it just doesn't work. What's the solution? You don't have a summit in the first place. What's the solution? You listen to Ukraine because Ukraine as a country should not exist given everything Russia has done to it. And yet they manage to survive because they know how to resist Kremlin aggression. And right now, Ukraine is under immense amount of pressure by the West, by the United States, to clean up its act, clean up its corruption and reform. But at the same time, maybe the United States should focus on that too. The U.S. wants Ukraine to de-oligarcharize, like get rid of the oligarch class, <laughs> like bring, contain the oligarchs. Well, I would love to see the West do that first. Show Ukraine how to do that, the United States, by reining in Jeff Bezos and Warren Buffett and Elon Musk and making them finally pay their fair share of taxes. You do that first and show Ukraine the way on how to do that. That's real U.S. leadership. So let's take a lesson from Ukraine, because Ukraine, as I keep showing, like going on and on on this show, shows how to get it done. You had the popular uprising that defeated Putin's puppy Yanukovych. That was a big arts festival. That was an uprising that encompassed you know, all walks of life across Ukrainian society. It was done despite pressure from European Western officials to go home and disperse and, and all that. Once again, we turn to Ukraine for lessons. What do you have there? You have Zelensky with his balls of steel. When Zelensky hears about this Putin summit, at the time when Putin has amassed 95,000 troops on Ukraine's border, what does Zelensky do? He needs to send a strong, urgent message to the White House. So he goes to Axios. He does an interview with Axios. He speaks directly to the President of the United States through Axios, saying, what the hell is this? Why are you having a summit with Putin? Please meet with me first. What happens next? That interview with Axios, that leads to Zelensky getting an official invitation to the White House. So that meeting should take place next month. And then right when Biden's about to take the stage and do his big press conference at NATO, what does Zelensky do? He takes his balls of steel and he throws them on Twitter. <laughs> he announces that Ukraine is going to join NATO. And suddenly you have Twitter awash with everyone celebrating, thinking that Biden and the West actually did something right for a change and is going to bring Ukraine into NATO. This was all a big bluff, certainly to fuck with Putin's head 
and to force Ukraine into the conversation. So what happens? When Biden finally takes the stage for his big NATO press conference, Ukraine is the big topic of discussion. Well done, Zelensky. No one else is coming to your aid. You have to do what it takes to protect yourself. You have to be creative. And that is what he's doing. Biden, of course, had to say, no, we're not having you in NATO. You've got to clean up your act first. But again, show Ukraine how to clean up their act Reign in your own oligarchs first and show Ukraine how to do that. As a result, you know, Ukraine can join NATO. That path is there. But first, the West wants Ukraine to jump through all these hoops to fight its own corruption. That's going to be tough. But again, the big headline of this week's episode is if the West really wants Ukraine to get serious about corruption, the West needs to get serious about its own corruption because it's the same fucking corruption. It's the Kremlin golden handcuffs. It's the Kremlin dark money. It's the offshore bank accounts. It's all these loopholes. It's all the fancy accounting firms. It's all the legal warfare and the fancy law firms. Clean up your own damn corruption and stop putting all these unrealistic expectations and pressures on Ukraine. I'm someone that has spoken adamantly about corruption in Ukraine. I have told off Ukrainian officials to their face about the corruption in that country. And I'm telling you, West, you are failing. You are not living up to your own standards. And as a result, you are being played and you're losing your sovereignty and you're putting the lives of countless people at risk, including dissidents. You just had a young man, a young independent journalist, hijacked off a plane as it was traveling between two EU nations. And now he is being forced, he's being paraded across Kremlin propaganda TV inside Belarus, praising the great dictator and being forced to confess to things he didn't commit. That's a violation of the Geneva Convention. So because of the Western utter lack of strategy against this aggression, all of us could be Jamal Khashoggi. All of us can be Roman Protasevich, the independent journalist in Belarus who was kidnapped by Putin's puppet in Belarus. He hijacked off that plane. All of us are those dissidents right now when you have such a shameful, embarrassing, self-defeating foreign policy as we're seeing coming out of Blinken right now and Biden and their team and their Chamberlain advisors. It's just utter appeasement to Putin and his mafia state. So let's move on now to Blinken because we've got some things to say about him specifically. Welcome to the Anthony Blinken special. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Go for it. So you know how on Wall Street, you know how Wall Street works. People put in their time on Wall Street or they go, you know, then they go to the SEC, which is supposed to be the regulatory body of Wall Street. And it just becomes a revolving door of corruption. You work in the SEC, then you get a fancy job in Wall Street. So nobody's really watching. Basically, the foxes are guarding the hen house. That's how the SEC works. That's how Wall Street works. And, And now as a result, you have Wall Street being a gambling den. And all the gambling pit bosses that allowed the big financial crash of 2008 to happen, they're all back at it again and we're vulnerable to another crash, right? That's because we have a weak SEC. So you have the same thing going on with the DOJ. Why do you think Trump was allowed to come to power in the first place? Why do you think you've had all these slaps on the wrist? And and why do you think corruption is flourishing right now in America? Because you have these DOJ lawyers that's put in time at the DOJ, and then they rake in all this money working at like a handful of powerhouse law firms. It's a revolving door of corruption. Key examples of this is you had, and the FBI works the same way, you had two FBI directors, William Sessions and Louis Freya, go from being directors of the FBI to serving as lawyers to the Russian mafia. So again, a revolving door of corruption. So Anthony Blinken has entered his own revolving door of corruption after serving in the Obama White House, where he should have had a come to Jesus moment, where from that time under Obama, he should have woken up to, wow, global corruption really made us vulnerable to Putin's attack in 2016. And how do we make sure that never happens again? Instead, Blinken spent his years after Obama's White House and under Trump raking in a bunch of money, setting up his own lobbying firm and serving a lot of massively powerful, giant corporate clients who are currently causing a lot of destruction on the planet. And so because he had so many lucrative contracts in his time before becoming Secretary of State, how are we to expect he's going to be serving what's best for the American public if it might jeopardize the interests of his former or potential clients? So some of these clients include Facebook. Yep, Blinken was serving Facebook. Facebook is, of course, the Fox News of social media. It's pushing out the big lie, hate speech, and flooding the zone with shit, as Steve Bannon would call it. 
Facebook has been defiant in whitewashing their role in uh, furthering political extremism and dangerous disinformation. This, of, of course, has led to real-world violence. Uh, one key example of this is Kyle Rittenhouse, the kid who organized over Facebook an effort to go out and confront Black Lives Matter protesters in Wisconsin, which led to Kyle Rittenhouse killing two innocent people in cold blood and becoming a right-wing hero for it because all these people are brainwashed over Facebook. Then you have Blackstone, another Blinken client. According to The Intercept, a top financier of Trump and McConnell is a driving force behind Amazon deforestation. Steve Schwartzman is the CEO of the Blackstone Group, which partially owns a Brazilian firm that is helping transform the Amazon from jungle to farmland. All right, so Biden wants to make fighting climate change central to his foreign policy. He's talking about this during his Europe tour. He has the former Secretary of State, John Kerry, in a role solely dedicated to the U.S. global effort for fighting climate change. But yet his current Secretary of State worked for Blackstone Group, which is strangling the lungs of the planet by raking in money over deforestation in the Amazon. So how does that work? Anthony Blinken. Then you have Boeing. Boeing was another client. Boeing has, of course, a long history of corruption and utter lack of transparency. Boeing has had to pay millions in fines for overcharging the U.S. government in their contracts. The most recent scandal, of course, was gambling with public safety in order to protect its profits, which led to two deadly plane crashes by its uh, 737 MAX plane jets. Boeing, a giant greedy corporation with a serious transparency issue, Blood money is more important than public safety, apparently, for Boeing. And then there's more from the Wall Street Journal. Mr. Blinken, through his share of Ridge Line Partners LLC, which is part of West Exec Ventures, which is his lobbying firm where he's been serving all these big corporate clients I've been listing. Mr. Blinken, through his share of Ridgeline Partners LLC, which is part of Westec Ventures, indirectly holds stakes in a dozen technology companies, half of which involve data management. One tech firm included on Mr. Blinken's disclosure form, Elroy Air, develops drones. Two companies, Neural Magic and Zenith, operate in the artificial intelligence sector, while Raven Ops develops robotics. Arrangements have been made to divest the interest in Ridgeline, according to the disclosure form. And this is from the Wall Street Journal. We'll link to it in the show notes for this episode, which you find is always on the Patreon page. Great. So we have a Secretary of State who has in the past profited from artificial intelligence and robotics, which, you know, as we're always saying on this show, the authoritarian playbook is classic. It's predictable. It's the same tools of repression and terror used generation after generation. There's nothing novel about the authoritarian playbook. Where it becomes harder to predict is how technology evolves and how technology can be used by the authoritarians to suppress people. That's why AI and robotics are terrifying, because that's the next Pandora's box. He just seems like the classic revolving door of corruption, going to government, going to corporations, and back to government again. And none of us are safer for it. I absolutely agree. And, you know, I have some information here to cover that has to do with Blinken's own background, his own family connections into various governments. I want to be clear here that I think anyone should be judged on their own decisions, their own actions, their own choices. And I think Andrea has laid out a very compelling case for why Anthony Blinken should not be trusted, why he should not have been made Secretary of State due to conflicts of interest that he pursued on his own. But on top of that, there are conflicts of interest with Blinken that make him in the Secretary of State role a challenge for the Biden administration regardless. This is just something that should have been discussed earlier and considered. So Anthony Blinken's stepfather, the man who raised him, is Samuel Pissar. And Samuel Pissar, throughout the latter half of the 20th century, was a mainstream figure, a major figure in world affairs. He served in the JFK administration. He worked for the United Nations. He was made a member of the French Legion of Honor by Nicolas Sarkozy. Sarkozy, of course, went on to be indicted and convicted for corruption, but that's another story. The thing that is disturbing about Samuel Pissar is that he was also the lawyer and very close friend 
of Robert Maxwell, who we have discussed on this show many times. So Robert Maxwell is a key figure in what we've been calling the transnational crime syndicate masquerading as a government, or at least he was until he uh, died mysteriously on a yacht or off a yacht in November of 1991. Give you the short version. Maxwell was a Mossad agent slash UK publishing tycoon who was working on the side for the Russian mafia, specifically for Semyon Mogilevich, the head of the Russian mafia, who Robert Mueller had vowed to hunt down at all costs. He did not do that. Instead, he protected Trump. And this is the branch of the Russian mafia that Trump and his cohort are essentially working for and linked to. And when Andrea mentioned William Sessions, and in particular, Louis Free, leaving their positions as heads of the FBI and going on to work for the Russian mafia, again, it is Mogilevich who they went on and worked for. Robert Maxwell is also, as you may know, the father of Jelaine Maxwell, who was the partner of Jeffrey Epstein, the child rape trafficker who is embedded in multiple international espionage operations. It seems to be with a wide variety of countries, including the United States, Russia, Israel, and Saudi Arabia. So anyway, these are these are the worst people in the world. These are the most dangerous people people in the world. And Robert Maxwell's death in 1991 was very mysterious. There are claims that he was murdered. There are claims, you know, it was suicide. It was an accident. He fell off a, yeah, I describe all this in my book, Hiding in Plain Sight. And, you know, quite frankly, all this should be covered more. Anyway, the last person to see Maxwell alive was Samuel Pissar. And I'm not at all suggesting that he murdered him. I'm just sort of stressing this to say the closeness of the relationship. Like, you might think, okay, well, Robert Maxwell fooled a lot of people. Like a lot of people thought he was just this sort of mega tycoon publishing asshole who, you know, made a ton of money and was kind of like a scandal monger and was caught up in these shady circles with people like Adnan Khashoggi and Donald Trump and, you know, others in the uh, Iran Contra era of the 90s. But, and you might think, okay, if he tricked all these people, maybe he also tricked his very close friend, Samuel Pissar. I do not believe that that was the case. And the reason I don't believe that was the case is because this Mossad agent, Robert Maxwell, was given this absolutely incredibly lavish state funeral in Israel after he died. And I'm just going to you know, read a little from the official announcement of that. It says, President Chaim Zergog and President Minister Yitzhak Shamir headed a galaxy of dignitaries and politicians, both government and opposition, who attended the funeral. Herzog delivered the eulogy for the multimillionaire publisher whose holdings in Israel, including Mariv, are estimated at $300 million. And this is a quote from Herzog. Maxwell scaled the heights of human endeavor. Kings and princes waited on him. Many admired him. Many disliked him. But none were indifferent to him. And then here we go. Maxwell's widow, Elizabeth, and their seven sons and daughters were at the graveside for the traditional Jewish burial service. Kaddish was recited by Maxwell's longtime attorney and personal friend, fellow Holocaust survivor, Samuel Pissar. So I really doubt that the person reciting the Kaddish at the funeral is going to be ignorant of Maxwell's secret life, of his shady foreign connections, and probably of his illegal activity. And my view on this was solidified when it was revealed in French newspapers that after serving as Maxwell's lawyer and you know very close confidant, close personal friend, Pissar went on to be the intermediary between Jeffrey Epstein and the French government. And we're going to post articles about this in the show notes. Like, I'm sorry, but that's too much of a coincidence. You know, this is a vast operation, but it, it seems clear that there's some continuity between what Robert Maxwell is doing and what Epstein and Jelaine Maxwell is doing. And so you see Samuel Pissar showing up again and again with his own incredibly long and vast network 
of international connections, which would be very useful for a criminal syndicate like this. And you would think, well, he should know better. I mean, particularly after hobnobbing with Robert Maxwell, perhaps he would be wary of continuing that with uh, his criminal daughter's criminal partner, Jeffrey Epstein. But no, he seemed to solidify this operation. There is no indication that Anthony Blinken himself is involved in any of this, you know, and I have looked and I have not found anything. He has not commented on it in any way except to say, you know, his stepfather was an enormous inspiration to him and influence on him. He didn't say it was, you know, because of all this shit. I think it's because of his role as a statesman and maybe because he, I think a lot of this just isn't known to the general public. I do think it's known to Anthony Blinken, but regardless, regardless of what he thinks, the fact is all of this makes Blinken very vulnerable to compromise because when your stepfather is linked to this many international criminal conspiracies, all of those evil operators, all of those mafiosos and governments likely have, or not even likely, they have information on his own family. And it's likely that the continuing Epstein operation has information on him too. And so that makes him more vulnerable, it potentially in a position to be threatened himself. And that to me makes him a very poor choice to lead the State Department. It makes the State Department itself vulnerable. And we've seen this, you know, we saw this throughout so many administrations, how these nepotistic ties, these shady connections, how they are very easily exploited by bad actors. And, you know, I always say like the, the solution here is you come clean about this. You know, you speak openly about this. If you have nothing to do with it, then, then just say so. But Either way, I mean, the, the combination of this personal disturbing history with what Andrea laid out about his financial entanglements, about his personal choice to integrate himself with all of these corrupt corporations and individuals, it adds up to a very unsafe situation for the American public. Without question. And it all comes down to corruption. You need a strong secretary of state who is going to call the enemy by name and confront it. And that is corruption, corporate corruption, oligarch corruption, whether those corporations and, and, and oligarchs are in the US or Ukraine or the UK or France or Germany or Russia. It's all the same enemy. It's a global enemy. It's a transnational crime syndicate. And so for people on the left who are like, enough with Russia, Russia's not our enemy, China's not our enemy. It's the corruption that is running those autocratic states and they're threatening our own weakened dem feeble democracy here at home. They're empowering the half of the United States that is fine with corruption, that justifies corruption as a quote unquote free market ideology, that justifies violence as a quote unquote white evangelical patriarchy ideology. So at the end of the day, we need a secretary of state like Elizabeth Warren. You know, if I were the advanced AI writing this current simulation that we're all stuck in, <laughs> I would hack the system. I'd go full Matrix and, and Neo and put Elizabeth Warren as a secretary of state. Just to hammer in the point is we are up against corruption. And you cannot have an Anthony Blinken as secretary of state who is going to leave his office one day soon and go profit from these abusive power structures that his lack of accountability, his poor advice for the summit, this Putin summit, are propping up. Our discussion continues, and you can get access to that by signing up on our Patreon at the Truth Teller level or higher. We want to encourage you to donate to your local food bank, which is experiencing a spike in demand. We also encourage you to donate to GLAAD, an organization on the front lines of fighting for the rights of LGBTQ people at a time when they, especially trans people, are under attack by repressive and harmful Republican legal warfare. Support their critical work at GLAAD. G -L -A -A -D .org. We also encourage you to donate to the International Rescue Committee, a humanitarian relief organization helping refugees from Syria. Donate at rescue.org. And if you want to help critically endangered orangutans already under pressure from the palm oil industry, donate to the Orangutan Project at the orangutanproject.org. Gaslit Nation is produced by Sarah Kenzier and Andrea Chalupa. If you like what we do, leave us a review on iTunes. It helps us reach more listeners and check out our Patreon. It keeps us going. And you can also subscribe to us on YouTube. 
Our production managers are Nicholas Torres and Carlin Daigle. Our episodes are edited by Nicholas Torres, and our Patreon-exclusive content is edited by Carlin Daigle. Original music in Gaslit Nation is produced by David Whitehead, Martin Vissenberg, Nick Farr, Damian Ariaga, and Carlin Daigle. Our logo design was donated to us by Hamish Smith of the New York-based firm Order. Thank you so much, Hamish. Gaslit Nation would like to thank our supporters at the producer level on Patreon and higher. Sean Rubin, Todd S. Perlstein, Pat, Kenny Maine, John Schoenthaler, Frank Jackett, Ellen McGirt, Joel Farron, Larry Gasson, Erica Moore, Karen A. Deal, Nico Phillips, Brian E. Castor, Lex Reed, Andrea Scalzo, Melicia Howland, Karen Heisler, Jordan Sanders, Ann Bertino, Rachel Winder, T.R. Dunstan, Kim, John Millett, David East, Shannon Nacy, Ida, Chris Fellow, Dodi Pop, Kristen Bredemus, Ben Wheaton, Joseph Mara Jr., Rich Halcom, Thomas Scheibe, Kelsey Malsom, Julie Matthews, Meganopolis, Mark Mark, Matthew Womack, Sean Berg, Kristen Custer, Tracy Ash, Benjamin Galuza, Kai Gillis, Sharon Hatrick, Irv Robinson, Keith Goldshock, William Barry Reeves, John Atris, Richard Smith, Emmy, Kevin Gannon, Sandra Collins, Katie Masuris, John Laughlin, Jeff Thompson, James D. Leonard, Evan Rosemore, Leo Chalupa, Carol Golstad, Michael Woldridge, <laughs> Kramer, no criming, <laughs> Jason Benke. Joe Darcy, Anne Marshall, Jeremy Lewis, Shrigve, Christine M, D.L. Singfield, Matt Perez, Nicole Spear, Kelly Ranson, Brian Tejudin, Christy Vital, Maureen Murphy, Michelle Dash, Jens Eilstrup Rasmussen, Dorothy Kamerick, Victoria Olson, Alabama, Z.W., Lisa LaFlame, Jason Bainbridge, Katherine Anderson Karina, Sarah Gray, Mike Tripico, Diana Gallagher, John Ripley, Ethan Mann, Jennifer Slavic, Yay Itzma, David Porter, Kate Cotton, Kim Mellon, Leah Campbell, Lynn Schneider, Jared Lombardo, Karen Humphreys, Giles Boquette, Ann Marshall, Irina Guardia, Eric Kaplan, Sonia Bogdanovich, and Tanya Chalupa. Thank you all for your support of the show. We could not make Gaslit Nation without you. Bye.